فإن أشركت ليحبطن عملك ولتكونن من الخاسرين بل الله فاعبد وكن من الشاكرين وما قدر الله حق قدره وما قدر الله حق قدره والأرض جميعا قبضته والأرض جميعا قبضته يوم القيامة والسماوات مطويات بيمينه والسماوات مطويات بيمينه سبحانه وتعالى عما يشركون ونفخ في الصور فصعق من في السماوات فصعق من في السماوات ومن في الأرض إلا من شاء الله ثم نفخ فيه أخرى فإذا هم قيام ينظرون وأشرقت الأرض بنور ربها ووضع الكتاب وجيء بالنبيين والشهداء وقضي بينهم بالحق وهم لا يظلمون ووفيت كل نفس ما عملت وهو أعلم بما يفعلون وسيق الذين كفروا إلى جهنم زمرا وسيق الذين كفروا إلى جهنم زمرا حتى إذا جاءوها فتحت أبوابها وقال لهم خزنتها ألم يأتكم ألم يأتكم رسل منكم يتلون عليكم يتلون عليكم آيات ربكم وينذرونكم وينذرونكم لقاء يومكم هذا قالوا بلى ولكن حقت كلمة العذاب قالوا بلى ولكن حقت كلمة العذاب على الكافرين قيل ادخلوا أبواب جهنم قيل ادخلوا أبواب جهنم خالدين فيها خالدين فيها فبئس مثوى المتكبرين وسيق الذين اتقوا ربهم وسيق الذين اتقوا ربهم إلى الجنة زمرا حتى إذا جاءوها حتى إذا جاءوها وفتحت أبوابها وفتحت أبوابها وقال لهم خزنتها وقال لهم خزنتها سلام عليكم سلام عليكم طبتم فادخلوها خالدين وقالوا الحمد لله وقالوا الحمد لله وقالوا الحمد لله الذي صدقنا وعده وأورثنا الأرض نتبوأ من الجنة حيث نشاء فنعم أجر العاملين وترى الملائكة وترى الملائكة تحافين من حول العرش وترى الملائكة تحافين من حول العرش يسبحون بحمد ربهم يسبحون بحمد ربهم وقضي بينه بالحق وقضي بينه بالحق وقيل الحمد لله وقيل الحمد لله رب العالمين <تصفيق> 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 
الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. That was um, Abdul Khalid Abdul Jalil. That's the name of the reciter. Khalid Abdul Jalil. And he's reciting the last ayats of Surah Zumar. Surah Zumar, Surah number 39 in the Quran. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Or I haven't found this dua particularly in any of the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam But this is a dua that you hear many Imams making during Ramadan In the Qunut Allahumma ja'al khayra a'marina khawatimaha Wa khayra a'marina awakhiraha وَخَيْرَ أَيَّامِنَا يَوْمَ نَلْقَاكَ O oh Allah, make the best of our deeds خَيْرَ أَعْمَالِنَا خَوَاتِيمَهَا Make the best of our deeds, the last of our deeds. وَخَيْرَ أَعْمَالِنَا أَوَاخِرَهَا And the best of our lives, the best of our years, the last of our years. وَخَيْرَ أَيَّامِنَا يَوْمَ نَلْقَاكَ And the best of our days, the day that we meet you. Such a profound dua. Such a profound way to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by asking Him. By asking Him to make the best of our deeds, the last of our deeds. And the best of our lives, the last of our lives, and the best of our days, the day that we meet him. Such a profound dua. With all of the death that is going on around us, I would like to think that as Muslims, as God conscious people, that there's not a day that goes by except that there's a portion of our day where we consider the day that we are put into the grave. With all of the death that we see going on around us, I would like to think that as Muslims, there is not a day that goes by that we don't think about the day that we are put into the grave. The day that we die. Who's going to wash your body? The day that you die, who's going to wash your body? Have you had that discussion with anybody? Have you discussed with your wife? Have you discussed with your children? Have you discussed with your husband? Who's going to wash my body? That's a conversation that many people just avoid. But you need to have this conversation with your spouse. Who's going to wash your body? When you are laying on that slab, and it's time for you to get your ghusl. Who's going to be the one to lay the sheet over you and wash your body? And who are you going to task with doing that? <clears throat> Have you had that discussion yet? Who's going to pay for your plot? Who's going to be responsible for that plot, that space where you're going to be buried at? These are real conversations. A couple of weeks ago, we covered the dua where the morning remembrance, where the Prophet Sallallahu used to say in the morning, Allahumma. إِنِّي أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ الْكُفْرِ وَالْفَقْرِ وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ عَذَابِ الْقَبْرِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَا أَنْتِ O oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from kufr, from disbelief, والفقر, and poverty. وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ عَذَابِ الْقَبْرِ And I seek refuge with you from the punishment of the grave. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَا أَنْتِ There's nothing worthy of worship except you. This is one of the morning remembrances. 
اللهم إني أعوذ بك من الكفر والفقر وأعوذ بك من عذاب القبر لا إله إلا أنت O oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from kufr, from disbelief, wal faqr, and poverty. And I seek refuge with you from the punishment of the grave. La ilaha illa ant, nothing worthy of worship except you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ma ra'aytu manzarin qat, illa wal qabr afdha' minhu. The Prophet ﷺ said, I have never seen anything more terrifying than the grave. I have never seen anything more terrifying. Afdha' min al-qabr. I have never seen anything more terrifying than the grave. <clears throat> we live in a time where people make jokes and make mockery about death make mockery out of people who've died and passed on. We live in a time, including Muslims, where death is not taken seriously. We live in a time where we have been desensitized. Desensitized to death because we don't know what happens afterwards. It's all kicks and giggles until the angel of death comes to collect your soul. It's all kicks and giggles, it's all laughs and jokes until the angel of death is coming to take your soul. My goodness, man. The, the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu said that I have never seen anything more terrifying, more scary than the grave. That means that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala allowed the Prophet, gave the Prophet Sallallahu a window into what happens after that. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala allowed the Prophet Sallallahu to hear the torture, the screaming that happens in the grave. We speculate. But as Muslims, we know, we believe in this text. We believe in the Quran and the Sunnah. We know without a doubt, with certainty, with full yaqeen, exactly what happens from the moment the person is taking their last breaths. We know exactly what happens. That's not a joke. When death is brought to your attention, immediately your mind goes to, I know exactly what's happening to him right now. I know exactly what's happening to her right now. Step by step, shayin for shayin, one thing after another, we know exactly what's happening. The Prophet Sallallahu passed by a janazah, a funeral, and the person's body was being put into the ground. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ud'u li akhikum fa innahu he said, make dua for your brother being put into the grave right now because he is about to be asked. He's about to be tested. He knew, we know step by step exactly what's happening to the person. Make dua for your brother for in the husa tetin because he's now about to be asked the questions in the grave. Uthman ibn Affan anhu, he said, ma akhafu ala nafsi layla fil qabr. Uthman ibn Affan anhuma, anhu, he said, the thing that I fear most for myself is my first night in the grave. ma akhafu ala nafsi layla fil qabr. The thing that I fear the most for myself is my first night in the grave. Your first night anywhere can be a bit scary. And you get married and you go home with your spouse for the first night. You're sweating. You're nervous. 
You don't want to do anything that would make them think that you're awkward or goofy or weird, even though you are. So you're trying to put up this facade, but the more you try to put up the facade, you know, the more, you know, frustrated, the more anxious you become. You're sweating. This is your first night of marriage. Your first day of school. Your first day on a college campus. It's a huge campus. You don't know anybody and you don't know people. And your first night anywhere is scary. Think about the first night in the grave. You've never been here before. It's cold. It's lonely. It's dark. You can hear other people around you being tortured. Some enjoying. Some being tortured. Think about that. I want you to sit and think about that for a second. Your first night anywhere is scary. Nothing like the grave. The Prophet Wasallam said that I have never seen anything more horrifying, more terrifying than the grave. Uthman said, the thing that I fear the most for myself is my first night in the grave. What part of this are we not understanding? While we live our lives and we, you know, enjoy and laugh and joke and, you know, everything is, a, you know, and this is especially for Muslims who spend their entire lives in sin and disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all a joke. Yeah, I know I'm supposed to be praying, but, you know, I don't feel like praying right now. Yeah, I know drinking is haram. Or I know smoking marijuana is haram. And why you got the blunt in your mouth? You know, well, you know, the scholars do differ about it, you know, and it's all a joke. It's all a joke. Yeah, I used to pray. I used to wear hijab, but, you know, I'm past that. Like somehow not wearing hijab means that you have evolved. You have evolved into what? Going forward doesn't always mean you're going forward. <laughs> Evolution doesn't always mean that you're going forward in the right direction. And it's all a joke. Sometimes you see just, you know, you just take a scroll through Instagram or you run into Muslims and play and you're just shaking your head like, you really think this is a joke, man? You really think this is a joke, man? It's kind of long. Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, listen to his comment. Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Inna min a'adham al-fiqh, inna min a'adham al-fiqh, an yakhaf al-rajl, an takhda'ahu dhunubuhu inda al-mawt, fatuhawwalu baynahu wa bayna al-khatimat al-husna. Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Inna min a'adham al-fiqh, he said, from the greatest knowledge that an individual can have is for a man to be afraid of how his sins are going to deceive him when he is about to die. All of the sins that you commit all the way up into the point of that very moment when you are about to take your last breath, how your sins are are going to come back to haunt you in that moment. In the min a'adham al-fiqh, the best knowledge that a man can have is the type of knowledge that will garner the fear of how his sins are going to deceive him at the moment he's about to die. And how your sinful lifestyle Prevents you from having a good ending. How your sinful lifestyle prevents you from having khatimatul husna. You having a good exit from this world. A good departure from this world. That's so why we made the dua at the beginning. Allahumma ja'al khayra a'marina a'marina khawatimah. Oh Allah, make the best of my deeds the last of my deeds. Meaning, make the best deeds that I do in my life the deeds that I do towards the last portion of my life. 
Some people sin all the way up until death is knocking on their door. Some people sin all the way up until the moment death is tapping on their door. Some people sin at the time that they are dying. Can you imagine a Muslim? Can you imagine a Muslim who is so immersed in a life of sin and disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you sinned all the way up into the moment that your, that your soul departed from your body? At no point did you have any intention on asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. At no point did you set aside some time in your life to make Toba to make sincere repentance for all of the things that you have done in your life. At no point you sinned all the way up until death was knocking on your door. And the thing that we need to understand is that the soul is removed from the body based upon the state in which the individual dies. I'll say that again. The soul is removed from the body based upon the state in which the individual died. The Prophet Sallallahu said, يُبْعَثُ كُلُّ عَبْدٍ عَلَى مَا مَاتَ عَلَيْهِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in a hadith that's collected in Sahih Muslim. يُبْعَثُ كُلُّ عَبْدٍ that every servant will be resurrected based upon how he died. In what state you died. That is how you will be resurrected. Meaning it's based upon your last deeds that you did right before you died. Your last deeds before you died. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in another hadith. من مات على الشيء بعثه الله عليه حديث collected in the مسند of Imam Ahmed where the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said من مات على الشيء whoever dies upon a thing meaning your last deeds بعثه الله عليه that is what Allah will resurrect you on that is what Allah سبحانه وتعالى will resurrect you on your last deeds اللهم جعل خير أعمال أعمالنا Oh Allah, make the best of our deeds the last of our deeds. Oh Allah, make the best of our deeds the last of our deeds. Min mata ala shay, ba'athahullahu ali. That whoever dies on something, that is what he will be resurrected upon. So let me give you just a brief glimpse. Let me paint a picture for you. For everybody who thinks it's a joke. Let me paint a picture for you. And let me show you what happens from an Islamic perspective. For those of you who are not Muslim that are listening, maybe you don't necessarily believe in Islam. Maybe, don't, maybe you don't necessarily understand because your book or any book outside of the Quran is filled with so many different exaggerations and alterations and personal words, words that are not the words of God, but the Quran and the Sunnah, these these, there can be nothing more truthful than this. Follow me. First of all, the angel who is responsible for taking your soul, we know him as the angel of death. That is the angel that whose sole task is to remove the souls from those whose lives have come to an end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kullu nafsin ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Every soul will taste death. Meaning it's an experience that every human being has to go through. Notice Allah didn't say everybody will die. He said every soul, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ Every soul will taste death. The tasting of it meaning you will experience the transition from the physical life into the meta, meta, metaphysical life or the spiritual life. Everyone will have to take that journey. Everyone will have to make that transition. The physical body that you have right now that is walking around on the earth is only providing the soul with a human experience. You understand? 
The physical body that you guys are walking, that we are walking around in right now is only a vessel that is providing the soul that is in it with a human physical experience. That's it. But that body that you have, this body that we have, it has a time limit. It has a limit. No one knows when that limit is going to be up. No one. Which is what should make us even more, you know, thoughtful and more aware of, you know, because we never know. To this morning you woke up, but you might not make it to the end of the day. Tonight, you might make it to the night, but you might not make it to the morning. And we live every single day like that. Every single day, not knowing is today my day. Is today the day that I'm going to go? And if you think like that, then you are more aware of your actions. You are more aware. You, you, you understand that your life has a greater purpose and that wasting time is not an option. And I get it. Sometimes we get distracted. But our job is to get to a point in our lives where we are 100 percent conscious. We're aware of it at all times. That is the point that we are trying to get to, that we are aware that my time here is limited and we are aware of that at all times. Now, being aware of that at all times is going to kind of infringe on your happiness in the world. But some of us are in our 30s and 40s and 50s. And haven't you had enough fun? Haven't you had enough fun? What more is there out there for you that you haven't done? That you are willing to risk it? <laughs> You're willing to risk it all? SubhanAllah, <laughs> man. The angel of death is the angel that is responsible for taking and collecting your soul at the time that your body has expired. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قُلْ يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ مَلَكُ الْمَوْتِ الَّذِي وُكِّلَ بِكُمْ ثُمَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ تُرْجَعُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, your soul will be taken by the angel of death. Allah called him مَلَكُ الْمَوْتِ Say your soul will be taken by the angel of death who is in charge of collecting your soul. And then you will be returned back to your Lord. However, the angel of death has helpers. He doesn't do it all by himself. The angel of death, he has helpers that helps him collect the souls of those who die. He doesn't do it all by himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in one of the great surahs in the last juz of the Quran, Surah to Nazi'at. I discussed this surah with my sixth graders. We were covering in our tafsir class with my sixth graders. They were mind blown. They never even knew. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالنَّازِعَاتِ خَرَقًا وَالنَّاشِطَاتِ نَشْطًا وَالسَّابِحَاتِ سَبْحًا فَالسَّابِقَاتِ سَبْقًا فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ أَمْرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning of this surah, he swears by four different angels. Four. I don't know if you guys were aware of that. A Naziat, Naziat, Gharaka. A Naziat, Allah says, I swear by the angels who rip the soul out of the body. I swear, Allah is swearing by these angels. When He uses the wow here, one Naziati Gharaka, one Nashi, what? The wow here is called wow al qasam in the Arabic language. Wow al qasam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses it all the time. Wal asr. Wow al qasam. That means Allah is swearing by something. Swearing. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowed to swear by his creation. We swear by 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not swear by Allah's creation. We swear by Allah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, khaliq al kulli shay, the one who created everything, he can swear by whatever he wants. It's his creation. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by something, he's trying to draw your attention to it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by something, he's trying to draw your attention to it. And by the angel that rips the soul out of the body. And by the angel that takes gently the soul out of the body. And by those angels that float along and those that race, the angels that race to the scene to grab the, the to grab the soul. And by the one who you debbir, he plans and plots out all of the affairs. The reason why the angel rips the soul out of the body is this mentioned in the hadith of Bara that we're going to talk about. The fajr, the sinful Muslim. We're talking about Muslims here. We're not talking about disbelievers. We're talking about sinful Muslims. You're drug dealing Muslims. You're drinking alcohol, partying Muslims. You're not praying, not fasting, you know, I don't eat pork, I don't pray, I don't fast, I don't read the Quran, I don't remember Allah, illa qalil, except a little bit type of Muslims. You're drug dealing, you know, posting on Instagram, Muslims. You're tattoo on your neck, tattoo on your face, carrying guns on you, killing other Muslims, type of Muslims. The Prophet Sallallahu said, for Ammal Fajr, as for the sinful, disobedient Muslims, when he is transitioning into the hereafter, right? Fornicating Muslims, right? You sleeping around with everybody, Muslims. You having children out of wedlock, Muslims. You're removing your hijab to allow the whole entire world to see what should only be for the person that you love the most from amongst mankind, and that is your spouse. Nah, I, this is, I don't know how many opportunities I'm going to get to speak to you, so I have to be as raw as I possibly can. You guys have been placated. Your feelings have been placated. You guys have been coddled as Muslims because you have these Muslims that come on and preach Islam and they always want to choose the, the most beautiful words and they want to convey the rap, the message in such a beautiful, fancy, you know, covering. And I'm sorry, I'm not that person. You might want to go follow somebody else. You might want to go listen to somebody else. I'm not that person. I have to be as raw as possible. That's the only way that I, that's the only way that I know how to be. I'm sorry. Because my hope is that somebody who is guilty of the things that I'm mentioning will hear this and it will strike a fear in them enough for them to change their lives. I am not going to package my message in a way that makes you feel comfortable. I have to make you uncomfortable. I have to make you uncomfortable. And the sad thing about that is that's what makes many of you dislike me. You don't dislike me because you don't know me personally, but you dislike me because you don't like the way that I make you feel. And what doesn't challenge you is not going to change you. I am not here to make you feel good. You can go to church for that. You can go listen to any of your local <laughs> imams that are so concerned with not offending you. I don't care about offending you. 
That's the difference between me and them. They get paid as imams, students of knowledge. They are employees. They get paid at their local masjid to make you feel good. I don't get a damn thing and I don't care about your feelings. I'm sorry. I don't get paid to make you feel good. I'm doing this because I love you. I'm doing this out of pure love and I have to make you uncomfortable. That's the only way you're going to change. You're not going to change if I make you feel good. The Prophet Sallallahu said, وَأَمَّ fajr." As for the sinful, as for the sinful Muslim, أَمَّ fajr." As for the sinful, rebellious Muslim, when he is transitioning into the hereafter, when as he is transitioning into the hereafter, one min dunya, and his time in this life is up. Atahu malikul maut. The angel of death will come to him. This is you. Let me take you to the point where you're at. You're at your last. You're, you're at your last taking your last breaths. The last breaths and the angel of death is coming to you to collect your soul. All right. I want to I want to take you there to that moment to the scene. You're at your last breaths. You don't even know. You stepped out of your house. You got into a car accident. You're laying there. You're taking your last breaths. For you drug dealing, street thug, Muslims, you know, you got popped in the head. You know, somebody popped you, you know, however your situation, you know, came about. And you're laying there in the street in a puddle of blood. You're laying there in the street in a puddle of blood. And the angel of death comes to you. Atahu malikul mot. The angel of death comes to you. Fayakud inda ratihi. And he sits by your head. Wayanziru malaika. Suad al wajj. Al wuju. Suad al wuju. And other angels come along with the angel of death. And they have black faces. Ma'ahum musawwah. And they're carrying with them something to collect your soul on. فَيَقْعُودَ عِنْدَهُ مَدَّ basar, And they sit close to the body from a distance as far as the eye can see. فَيَقُودُ الْمَلَكُ mot. So the angel will say to the soul, this is the body laying on the ground. All of the, the angel of death and all of the other angels are sitting around. They're, they're about to collect your soul. The angel of death says to the soul, as the body is laying there, body is expired. The soul got to come out of that body. The angel of death is there to collect the soul. The angel of death says to the soul, Akhriji nafsil khabitha. Come on out, you filthy soul. You sinful, disobedient soul, come on out. Come out. The angel of death is calling for the soul. All of this is happening in a spiritual world. And so while the person is sitting there taking their last breaths, they don't even realize from a physical standpoint, we're physically standing over the body. But we can't see what is happening on in the other world. We can't see what's happening in the other world. We just see the person laying there taking their last breaths. That's what we see. But we don't see what's happening on the other side of that. All of this is taking place within seconds very quickly because it moves very quickly. I'm slowing it down for you. I'm putting it in slow motion. 
so you can actually actualize how this is happening. But this happens very quickly. This is a very, you know, the creatures from the other world, they move quick as the blinking of an eye. So it happens very quickly. I'm slowing it down for you a little bit so you can follow. So the person's body is laying there. They're taking their last breaths. The angel of death is coming along with other angels to collect this soul. The angel of death says, Akhriji, come on out. Come on out, you filthy soul, you sinful soul, you disobedient soul. The angel of death already knows in what state you died. Akhriji. Come on out, oh you filthy soul, you disobedient soul, you sinful soul. Come on out to the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the displeasure of Allah. It's almost like if I had to put it in words, right? It's like you saying to someone, come on, let's go. I gave you a shot, I gave you an opportunity, and you ruined the opportunity, let's go. How long did Allah give your soul in that body? You was on earth for 70 years. You was on earth for 80 years. You was on earth for 60 years. You was on earth for 40 years. You died at 44. You died at 48. You died at 53. You died at 55. You died, how much time did a God give you? And you squandered every single year that God gave you on earth. 50 years, 60 years, 65 years old. And you still died as a sinful, disobedient person? You still managed to die in a state where God is displeased with you? He said, come on out. إِلَى سَخْتٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَغَضَبٍ Come on out to the anger of Allah. Come on out to the displeasure of Allah. Qala fatafarraqa fi jasadihi. So the soul begins to look for a place to hide in the body. All of this is going on at the time that the person has now expired. The person's heart has stopped. Person is done. Physically, your body is done. It has expired. Your body has expired. It's over. Now the soul is now looking for a place to hide in the body because it does not want to come out. The soul is hiding in the body because it doesn't want to come out. The Prophet ﷺ said that the soul starts to go over to different places in the body. And then the angel of death reaches in to snatch the soul out of the body. And the sound that it makes is like when you pull Velcro apart. Shh. That's the sound that it makes. Almost like pulling Velcro apart. Take a piece of Velcro and pull the Velcro apart. Shh. That is what it sounds like when the angel of death is ripping the soul out of the body. Because the soul doesn't want to leave. The soul knows that it has an entire eternity to face. There can be nothing more scarier than that. And we didn't even get to the grave. We're just talking about the process of death. We didn't even get to the grave part yet. SubhanAllah. Allahumma gfir lana. Allahumma rahamna. O oh Allah, forgive us. O oh Allah, have mercy upon us. Allahumma tajawaz anna sayyatina. O oh Allah, overlook our faults and our mistakes. 
Allahumma ja'al khayra a'mal a'malina khawatimaha. Oh Allah, make the best of our deeds the last of our deeds. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالنَّازِعَاتِ غَرَقَ And by the angels that rip the soul out of the body, this is what Allah is referring to. You can see how the Quran and the Hadith are aligned. This is how you know our religion is completely from God. No mistakes, there's no contradictions, nothing. Nothing. It all aligns. Allah swears by the angels and then the Prophet Sallallahu comes along in a situation that has nothing to do with the surah and the Prophet Sallallahu in this situation is explaining to us what Allah actually mentions in the ayat of the nazi ayat, the angels ripping the soul out of the body. SubhanAllah. فَيَقُمُونَ إِلَيْهِ فَلَا يَدْعُونَهُ يَدْعُونَهُ فِي يَدِهِ طَرْفَةَ عَيْنِ And then the angels, they rip the soul out of, along with the angel of death, they rip the soul out of the body. Pull the soul, extract the soul. This is an extraction. They have to now rip the soul out of the body because the soul is clinging to the body. It doesn't want to leave. It doesn't want to go because it knows that it has to answer for all of the things that it that it did. The angel rips the soul out of the body along with the other angels. And they seize the soul, grab the soul. And فَيَسْعَدُونَ بِهَا إِلَى السَّمَا And they take the soul up to the heavens for an immediate judgment. An immediate judgment. They take the soul out and they take the soul up. Each and every heaven that they pass, the doors are closed. None of the angels want to greet that soul. None of the angels want to talk to that soul. None of the angels want to embrace that soul. Until it gets to the highest heaven, the seventh heaven. It reaches the seventh heaven. غُلِقَتْ دُونَهُ أَبْوَابِ samawat. And the door is closed. God doesn't even want to talk to you. <laughs> and then it will be a caller will call out. One of the angels will call out that his affair is written in Sidjin. That what will make you know what is Sidjin? And that is that he is written amongst those who are sinful, disobedient. Like that's that's your immediate judgment. Until obviously on the day of judgment when your affairs have to be sorted out. But here again, you are raised upon what you die upon. You died in a state of disobedience. You died in a state of ghafla, of unconsciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, heedlessness of God. That's the state that you died in. So for now, your time in the grave, this is your immediate judgment. It's not Allah judging your whole situation. That will happen on the day of judgment. But for now, it's what's called Hayat al-Barzakh. Hayat al-Barzakhiyah, the life in the grave. That is the period that we wait with our bodies. Our souls wait with our bodies until resurrection. The soul will remain with the body until resurrection. But this is your immediate judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah has the angels call out to the other angels, Uktabu kitabahu fisijin. His book, his record, he is written amongst those who were sinful, disobedient, and whatever consequences is going to come to you is going to come to you because you are written from amongst those people. Then a command, a command comes for the soul to be returned back to the body. Put the soul back with the body. All of this happens in a matter of seconds. The person just died. The soul is extracted. The soul is taken up to the heaven for an immediate judgment. The soul is brought back down to sit with the body. And remain with the body until the day of judgment. The body is, is done. Body has expired. Physical body is over. 
but the soul remains, stays with that body. The soul stays with that body. فَيُرُمَا بِرُوحِهِ حَتَّى تَقَعَ فِي جَسَدِهِ The angels, they bring the soul back down and slam the soul back down into the body with force. It's handled in a very rough way. The way that it was extracted, the way that it was taken up to the heaven, and the way that it was thrusted back into the body. Handled in a very rough fashion. Because this soul, you know, its, it's ending is, is not good. So this is why the Prophet Wasallam said that when the person is being taken to the grave site, the person can hear everything. The person can hear everything. They can't hear because of the physical body, but the soul that is in the body that can't do anything is just trapped, it stays with the body. The soul can hear everything. The Prophet Wasallam said that when you walk the body to the graveyard, and you are walking away, the dead person, yes, al mawta, qara'a ni'al ahlihim. They can hear the footsteps of their family members as they're walking away. So while we're putting the body on, on the slab and we're washing the body and we're saying so many good things about the body and we're saying, oh, you know, this was my mom and she was such a great person. Oh, this is my brother in Islam and we're washing the body and we're having a conversation with each other while we're washing the body. Meanwhile, the soul is inside of the body can hear the entire conversation. The soul inside the body can hear the entire conversation. The Prophet ﷺ, during the Battle of Badr, all of the those who were slain on the battlefield from Quraysh, the Prophet ﷺ had a hole dug and pushed their bodies into the hole to bury them. And he stood over the bodies and he said, Hal wajattu ma wa'da rabbukum haqqa fa inni wajattu ma wa'adani rabbi haqqa. Have you found the promise of your Lord true? I indeed found the promise of my Lord true. Umar turns to the Prophet Sallallahu and says, O Messenger of Allah, are you speaking to people who are dead? These people are dead. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Ma anta bi asma' minni minhum, lakin la yujibun. They can hear me better than you can hear me, Umar. They just can't respond. They can hear you. Umar said, O Messenger of Allah, are you speaking to people who are dead? Are you speaking to those who are dead? The Prophet Sallallahu said, Umar, ma anta bi asma' minhum. Ma anta bi asma' minni minhum. Lakin la yujibun. He said, Umar, they can hear you better than you can hear me. They just can't respond. They can hear. The soul is still in the body. The soul can hear everything. And possibly the significance behind that is to add to the depression, to add to, you know, everything that the soul is about to experience if it died in a negative state. And perhaps if people have nothing but good to say about the person, oh, this person was a good person, oh, this person was this, the person was that, then perhaps that is, will add to the pleasure because there's something that we also believe in called adab al-qabr wa na'im al-qabr. And that is the punishment of the grave as well as the pleasure and the delight of the grave. So maybe that contributes to that. So the soul is brought back down from the heavens and slammed back into the body. Meanwhile, we're washing the body. Around this time, the body is wherever it is in our process. We're talking about the spiritual process, but how is that aligning with the the physical process. When our bodies die, we put them in a funeral home, we're washing them the next day, and within a couple of days, we're trying to get them into the ground. But there's a whole other process that is happening in the spiritual world. By the time we finish washing the body, we come to the masjid, we pray Salatul Janaza, Allahu Akbar, and we pray the four you know, we pray the four raka, the, the four tekbirat over the dead person. And then we start to head towards the grave. We're taking the body, putting the body into the casket, 
putting the body into uh, the, the hearse and we're now heading towards the graveyard. The believer, the one who died as a believer, he's saying, hurry up, hurry up and get me to my grave. He wants to go. Hurry up and get me to my grave. Hurry. The sinful, disobedient Muslim is like, I don't want to go. Slow down. You guys are moving too fast. Give me a few more days. Give me some more time. I'm not ready to go. Don't put me in the grave yet. I'm not done. I, he's still delusional, thinking that, you know, he can delay the inevitable. The sinful soul doesn't want to go. The believing soul is like, hurry up. What's taking you guys so long? You're moving too slow. Hurry up and wash my body. Get me shrouded. Pray over me. Hurry up. Get me to the grave. I'm ready to go. I hate this world. This world was a prison for me. Come on, get me to my place. I want to rest. Right? You ever been out and about and you just want to be, you just want to go home? You ever been out for a whole day shopping, doing whatever you're doing? And you're like, man, I just can't wait until I get home. I want to take a bath. I want to take a shower. I want to put my pajamas on. I want to kick my legs up. I want to lay in my bed. I just want to relax. No TV, no nothing. I just want to go home. That's what the believing soul is saying because he wants to go home. ready to go home hurry up you guys are taking too long and so finally we arrive at the graveyard and as we are carrying the casket the person in the casket can hear the conversation they can hear the Allahu Akbar the crying they can hear all of that And then finally, we reach the place, the plot, where the body is about to be lowered down into the grave. And there's nothing else that... There is nothing else that can that can be done for the person on that day. As the body is being lowered down into the ground, there's nothing that can be done for the person at that point. And as we take the handfuls of dirt and we throw the dirt on the casket, filling the grave up, Now, let me tell you what happens on the other side of that. I'm, I'm really trying to contain myself, honestly. The Prophet Wasallam said, فَتَأْتِيهِ الْمَلَائِكَ وَفِي رِوَايَةِ يَأْتِيهِ مَلَكَان Once the body is lowered into the ground, the dirt is put on top of the person. Two angels come to him. Aswadan Azraqan. These angels are black with blue eyes. These angels, their names, as it was mentioned in another hadith, are Munkar and Nakir. Munkar and Nakir. These two angels, they come to the person as they lay in their grave. This cold, lonely, dark place. You can hear the footsteps of everybody as they walk away. You're in your grave. And you can hear your, your mom as she's walking away. You can hear your, your wife and your kids. Your, your, your daughter's crying. Your son's crying. Your wife is crying. And you can hear them as they're walking away. And you're telling them, don't walk away. Don't go. Don't leave me. They're leaving you there. They're leaving you there. 
I want you to think about this. This is a woman who is taking her husband's body to a graveyard, digging a hole, putting him in the hole and leaving him there forever. That's it. Never be never to be seen again. You are leaving this person there. You are walking away, leaving this person in this place. You ever left a child somewhere where they didn't want to be? You ever took your child to daycare for the first day? And you as a parent, I want you guys to think about this, especially women, because you, you feel this. You ever took your child to daycare for the first time? And you leave your child there and you turn around and you say, have a good day. And you're walking away and your child just burst out in tears. Because... You're leaving them. They don't want you to go. And your daughter is holding on to your leg. And you're like, come on, honey, you got to stay. Your, your son is grabbing on to you. They're holding you. They don't want you to go because they don't want you to leave them. That's the same exact scenery that is happening in the grave. It's just that your soul can't reach out to you and touch you. Your soul can't reach out to you and touch you. I'm trying to make connections for you because this is all in a spiritual world. So if someone doesn't paint a picture for you, it's really hard to imagine. It's really hard to imagine. You ever seen a child grab the leg of the mom or the dad because they're leaving them at daycare and they don't want them to leave them? And your daughter's crying, your son is crying, your daughter's hollering. With girls, is even worse. With sons and daughters, is even worse. You're trying to leave your daughter at daycare, and like your heart is breaking because you gotta leave them because you gotta go to work. But you can't stand to see your child just breaking down like that. And so here you are at a graveyard about to bury the body of your mother, your father your husband, your wife, your child, you gave birth to, and you put them in the ground and you turn around and you have to make peace with the fact that this person's time on earth is over. You got to make peace with that. But the person that is in the grave has to make peace with the fact that you are gone, never to be seen again, never to be heard again, because once they walk away, that that cuts off all contact from that point forward. The person that is in the grave can no longer hear what's going on on earth. That's it. That severs that contact. That contact from that point forward. That means that we have contacts with our parents, with our relatives for the whole time that we hear up until the moment they go down into that grave and you walk away. That severs the connection. That severs the contact. That severs the contact. That's it. The person in the grave can never hear what is going on above the earth. And the person that is above the earth would have no idea what's going on underneath. The Prophet ﷺ said, as he's put into the grave, his Family members walk away. He can hear the footsteps of his family members as they walk away. Two angels come to him. Black in color, blue eyes. You've never seen creatures that look like this ever in your life. You've never seen anything like this in your life. These two angels come to you and they tell you, Kum. Sit up. They don't plead with you. They don't compromise with you. They give you straight commands and ask you straight questions. Kum, sit up. You in your grave now about to be questioned. And the angels, they ask you, Man Rabbu. Who is your Lord? Seem like very simple questions. 
And it seems like in this life, because I sat in a class or two, I kind of got the answers. I got it, kind of got it figured out. You know all the technical knowledge, but this is not about technical knowledge. These questions are not about technical knowledge. How many classes you sat in, how many lectures you studied, how many books you read. This is not, these questions are not about technical knowledge. You, we have to come to this realization early. These questions have nothing to do with your technical knowledge. Your technical knowledge, acquired information. These questions have nothing to do with how many lectures you've sat in, how many books you've read, how many, you know, Usuda Thadatha, that you've studied this book over and over and again. So you know the, who's your Lord, you know who, what is your religion, and you know who is your prophet. These questions are not about that. The angel, when he asks you, Men or Abbuk, who is your Lord? He's not asking you for technical knowledge. He's asking you, how did you live your life according to that question? Applied to eat. You know how they have applied economics? Apply this, applied to eat. That's what we need. We don't need any more technical knowledge about Tawheed, technical information that is just being pushed into the atmosphere about Tawheed. We need applied Tawheed. Tawheed in real time. Applied Tawheed. Man Rabbuk, who is your Lord? Meaning, how did you live your life according to this question? And the sinful Muslim, the sinful Muslim, he will say, La adri. I don't know who Allah is. <clears throat> I don't know. La adri. Who is your Lord? I don't know. You lived your entire life as a Muslim. Born and raised as a Muslim, but you never prayed. You never fasted. Ramadan came around, you was doing something else. The whole Muslim world fasting, but you doing you. <clears throat> Time for Salah. Never prayed. You never prayed. Day after day after day goes by in your life. Salat after salat, come in and go out. Come in and go out. Zuhur, come in and go out. Asr, come in and go out. Maghrib, come in and go out. No salat from you. No salat from you. Ramadan 2016 came, went. No fasting from you. Ramadan 2017. <clears throat> come and go. Ramadan 2018. Come and go. No fasting. You always has an, had an excuse. Oh, I'm sick. Or I can't fast. Or, I, you know, I, I can't do this. You always had an excuse. You didn't fast. You didn't pray. Quran sat right on your bookshelf. Right now, Quran's are sitting on your bookshelf. You have not opened it. When's the last time you opened it? So now when the question comes, who is your Lord? Men Rabbuk, who's your Lord? What do you think the response is going to be? I don't know. Because your response is based upon how you lived your life according to that question. Your, your response to that question is indicative of how you lived your life according to that question. Men Rabbuk, who's your Lord? I'm asking you guys right now, who's your Lord? If you say Allah is my Lord, why are you not living your life like Allah is your Lord? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not at the center of every decision that you make? Why is Allah not at the center of everything that you do in your life? Why? And then you think you're going to come to the grave and you're going to be able to answer that question with full confidence? You got to be kidding me. That's self-deception. Some of us are clearly deceiving ourselves. 
You're in the grave. The angel comes to you. Man Rabbuk, who's your Lord? The sinful, disobedient Muslim. Islam was just a pastime. You know, I go to the masjid when I'm hanging out with the Muslims. You know, I'll fast, you know, if, you know I'm, I'm around the Muslims. But then when I leave, you know, I'm going to go do me. You know, I'll pray, you know, whenever I'm, you know, my life is in peril or, you know, I'm going through something in my life and I need prayer, right? I need prayer. So I'm going to go pray. MashaAllah. Got you. So Islam is just a pastime. You just do it, you know, when it's convenient for you, you know. MashaAllah. So the angel asks you, Man Rabbu, who's your Lord? And the person says, La adri, I don't know. Wa ma dinuk, what is your religion? La adri, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I was born and raised Muslim. I took my shahada, I became Muslim, but I didn't really learn about Islam. I didn't really know the details. I didn't know this, I didn't know that. You know, I didn't know how to do this. Nobody told me about this. Nobody showed me this. Nobody taught me that. Right? Got it. So the angel, he doesn't say anything. His task is to ask you the questions. Who's your Lord? I don't know. Okay. What's your religion? You're being interrogated. Have you ever been interrogated before? You know what that feels like? Have you ever been in a room where three, four police officers or detectives come in a room? Some of them big, big white boys, big black guys come into a room and you sitting by yourself at this table. You think you real tough until you're sitting in that room. And, you know, two are standing over here. One is sitting, one playing the good guy and he's trying to level with you. He's trying to talk with you. They're trying to get information out of you. All right. You ever been traveling? And this is for like, you know, brothers who've, you know, gone a step further. Being interrogated by detectives for some drug beef is one thing. Being interrogated by Homeland Security coming through an airport is a whole completely different level. You you haven't you 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 don't know what interrogation is. Until you are with your wife and children and you're traveling from one country to the next and Homeland Security come grab you out of the line and say, hey, listen, you, know, you need to come with us. For what? What did I do? No, we just need to talk to you. And they bring you to a room. They tell you, hand them the cell phone. They're looking through your cell phone, looking through your laptop, your computer. They're asking you question after question after question after question. You don't know where this conversation is going. You don't know what information you're giving them, you know, and how that's going to be. You, you don't know to be interrogated. It's scary. <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> Trust me when I tell you, you don't know what that feels like. And then can you imagine being in your grave and then these two angels come to you and make you sit up and start interrogating you about the intricacies of your faith? Absolutely, it's happened to me. Absolutely, it's the story of my life. <laughs> Absolutely. Do, do you know what that feels like? To be interrogated. But you're being interrogated for your actions here on earth. In the grave, you're being interrogated about your faith. Who is your Lord? What is your religion? And who is your prophet? The disobedient Muslim will say, la adri, la adri, la adri. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. The hypocrite Muslim, the one who's Muslim, you know, outwardly, but deep down inside, he's something else or she's something else. They will say, ah, nash The hypocrite Muslim will say, I, I heard people saying this, so I just said what I heard people saying. I heard people saying Allah was my Lord, so I said Allah. I heard people saying, you know, Islam was my religion. <laughs> and I said what the people said. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, فَلَا يَزَالُ فِيهَا مُعَذَّبًا حَتَّى يَبْعَثُ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى مِنْ مَضْجَعِهِ هَذَا 
that this person will be tortured in his grave day and night until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises him from that very place where he lays. In another narration, the Prophet sallallahu wasallam, he said, وَمَعْهُمَا مِدْرَقْ مِدْرَقْ That these two angels, they carry with him, they carry with them a mallet. This big, huge hammer, they carry, they carry it. And they will strike him. فَيُضْرَبْ ضَرْبَةً بَيْنَ أُذُنَيْهِ he will be struck in between his two shoulders, <laughs> between his two ears, meaning on top of the head. The angels, they will take the hammer and they will strike him over the head. For each question he gets wrong. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, That he will let out a cry, he will let out a scream, that is so loud that everything in the heavens and the earth can hear it except human beings and jinn. As a mercy for us. Because you could you imagine if you could hear people being tortured in their grave? And this is why, as a Muslim, you want to be buried around Muslims. <laughs> you don't want, you know, your body and your situation to be handled in a very, you know, unprofessional way, and you end up buried around some Christians that are being tortured in their grave, and you gotta hear that torture going on day and night, day and night, because you can hear all of that. You, you don't want to be buried like that. I asked the brother, you know, one day we were talking, and I said, you know, how do you want to be buried? How do you want to be buried, man? Let, let me know. Because if you're playing around out in the streets and your family don't know that you're Muslim, your family don't respect you as a Muslim because you've never, you know, never given them any indication that you actually gave a damn about Islam. Guess how you're going to be buried? You're going to be buried as a Christian. You're going to be given as Christian. Here you are. You were known to many Muslims to be a Muslim, but your family never knew you were a Muslim. And the moment that you die, your grandmother, your mother, your auntie, you know, somebody's going to take control of your situation and they're going to bury you the way that they see fit. They're going to bury you as a Christian. They're going to take you to the church. Just imagine you were Muslim, took your shahada, converted to Islam, but you never taught, told your family about Islam. You never gave an inkling of, you know, a hint that you were, you know, Muslim and concerned about, you know what I mean? And then they, here they go with Christian putting makeup on your face, putting you in a, a, a suit, putting some, some, some shoes, some hard bottom shoes on you. They having an open casket for you at the church. Meanwhile, you was Muslim. They got the reverend, the preacher saying, you know, praising Jesus and asking Jesus to have mercy on you. Can you imagine? Can you imagine you being in the church? Because your grandmother said, nah, he wasn't no Muslim. He wasn't no Muslim. Why? Because you never, you never let your family know that you were Muslim by the way you practice and by the way you live your life. You said, Ma, I'm Muslim. Grandma, I'm Muslim. I'm Muslim, Grandma. Yeah, but you're saying that while you got a cigarette in your hand. You're saying that while you got a, a beer in your hand. You're saying that while, you know what I mean? And your family looking at you like, Muslim, please. I know Muslims. You ain't no Muslim. They don't even respect you as a Muslim. They don't even respect you as a Muslim. And the moment you die, grandma, you know, here we go, the Muslim community, we come to your grandma. You don't know how many Muslims I had to go to their houses. I had to go speak to their mothers and their grandmothers to try to retrieve their bodies so the Muslims can give them a proper burial. I can't tell you how many Muslims I've done that for. I can't tell you how many people I have gone to the homes of their families and their grandmother, their mother, like he wasn't no Muslim. It's like he was. He was a Muslim. Well, I can't tell because the boy used to drink and smoke and do everything else. So what type of Muslim was he? What type of Muslim were you? And it's just like, it's like, yo, man, get your affairs in order, man. Get your affairs in order. Brothers and sisters, get your affairs in order. Get your affairs in order. And what I mean by that is start making preparations for how you want to depart from this world, man. It's ridiculous, man. And then meanwhile, you got it all figured out. 
While you're here on earth, you on Instagram, you posting on Instagram, you flossing, you stunting, number one stunner. But your affair is not even in order. A real man, real woman, your affairs is in order, man. You already got that laid out. I know exactly how I'm going to be buried. My plot already, you know, you already made preparations for that, man. And then you got your, your drug dealing, hustling, you know, young Muslims who you out here carrying guns and you out here repping a street, repping a block, repping a hood, repping, you know, your gang. And then you get popped. And then, you know, we got to do a fundraiser for, for your janazza because you ain't had no money. How are you out in the streets hustling and you don't have at least $2,500 put to the side for your janazza, for your funeral process? Oh, I'm just trying to figure out what type of gangster are you? It's gangster not to leave your family in debt. It's gangster not to leave your family to scramble up money and do a GoFundMe page and raise money so that they can bury you properly. Meanwhile, you was out in the streets getting money. What money you was getting? Please tell me. You don't even have $2,500 put to the side so that you can have a proper burial. Meanwhile, you leave that task on your grandmother, your mother, your sister, and any other family member who actually gave a damn about you. Get your affairs in order, man. Get your affairs in order. Get your affairs in order, man. The Prophet ﷺ said he is hit over his head with this mallet. And he lets out a cry. He lets out a cry. He screams so loud that everything in the heavens and the earth can hear him scream except the human being in the jinn. As a mercy for us, if you could hear people screaming in their graves. You understand? The Prophet ﷺ said, Lola and Tadafanu. If it wasn't for the fact that you had to bury your dead in the ground, Allah and Yusmi'ukum Adab al Qabr. That if it wasn't for the fact that you had to bury your dead in the ground, I would make dua to Allah and allow him to let you hear the torture, the screams that are happening in the grave. The Prophet ﷺ said, if it wasn't for the fact that you had to bury your dead in the ground, I would make dua to Allah to let and let you hear the screams that are going on in the grave. If we could hear what's going on in the grave, we would never bury our dead down there. Everything in the heavens and the earth can hear those who are screaming in the grave because of being tortured. The only people that the only ones that can't hear them are us as human beings and the jinn. And that's as a mercy for us. As a mercy for us. So, you know, I want us to be mindful, you know, of what's happening here and what's going on. You know, this is the reality. This is the reality. So, that's... You know, she's gone. No worries. Shaitan always seems to slip one in there while we're talking and then, you know. But, you know, on the flip side of that, those who die on obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the second angel, one nashitati nashta, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the angels that take the soul gently. The Prophet ﷺ said, like a drop of water coming out of a drop of water coming out of a water skin. That's how the angels take the soul of the believer. The angels take the soul of the believer like a water drop coming out of a water skin. What nashitati nashta. The angels that remove the soul from the believer gently. 
And the reason why the believer's soul is removed gently is because the believer wants to go. He's tired of this world. This world was a prison. This world was, you know, every day I was here was a task. When you see living life in this world as, you know, just another day to get through so that I can get to my final destination. The believer wants to go. The believer has been ready to go. The believer's soul has already been attached to the hereafter. The believer's soul is only trapped in this world because it's a part of the physical body that has to, you know, go through the motions until its expiration date. You understand? The believer was already in the hereafter, was already connected, already looking forward to it. It's just that the physical body, I just got to wait with this physical body until it expires. So when the angels come to collect the soul of the believer, how is the soul already attached? Because of your connection to God. If you have a connection to God, you have a connection to the spiritual world. You, you are aware that you are a spiritual creature just having a physical experience. When you understand that, you are detached. You're here physically. It's just like when you're having a conversation with somebody and the conversation just doesn't appeal to you. You're there in the conversation physically, but mentally you're some to totally someplace else. You don't know how to disconnect. <laughs> we all know how to disconnect, detach, right? People in relationships, they're physically in the relationship, but their soul, their spirit, their mind, their emotions are somewhere else. They numb themselves to, you know, the situation that they're in physically. You understand? We do it all the time. I'm just talking about doing it from a spiritual perspective. You detach. I'm here physically. I'm going through the motions. I use the bathroom. I eat. I sleep. I do all of the things the physical body is supposed to do. But my soul is connected to the hereafter. I'm, I'm not a part of this life. I'm not a part of this life. I'm here physically, but spiritually, I'm, I'm already there. I'm waiting. Just, I'm just waiting for my time to be up, you know? And when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the angels come and they retrieve the soul in a gentle way. And when they retrieve the soul, the angel, he says to this particular soul, he said, Akhriji. The Malik al Mawt, the angel of death, says to the soul of the believer, Oh, you tranquil soul. Oh, you tranquil soul. Come on out to the forgiveness of Allah and His pleasure. Come on out to the forgiveness of Allah and his pleasure. You guys on Instagram is going to cut off. My phone is pretty much dead um, and I don't have time to charge it because we're almost done. So if you want to continue the conversation, you can head over towards uh, you can head over to Facebook. Facebook Live is still going, um, but um, you guys are going to cut off in a few minutes. All right. And I have to end it before it cuts off or otherwise it won't post to Instagram. All right. So go ahead to Facebook Live, inshallah, and you can continue the discussion there, inshallah. So the angel says to this particular soul, Come on out to the forgiveness of Allah and, and his mercy. You see the difference in how the angel addresses this particular soul in contrast to the other soul. This soul, the angel says to him, come on out 
Oh, you tranquil soul. When he was talking to the sinful disobedient, he said, Come on out, you filthy soul. But he addresses the soul differently. Here, come on out. Oh, you tranquil soul, you peaceful soul. Come on out to the forgiveness of Allah and his mercy. And they remove the soul. They don't have to go in and rip the soul out because the soul wants to go willingly. And the angels take the soul up to the heavens. And each heaven that the angels pass, they call him by, you know, his name. And it's like, this angel doesn't even know me, but this angel does know me. I've never seen this creature before, but yet this creature seems like he knows me. He knows my mom. He knows my dad. Calls him by his lineage. You know, each heaven that he passes. And when he gets to a sama as sabi'a, when he gets to the seventh heaven, a caller calls out and says, "Uktubu kitabahu fil iliyin." Write his book amongst the iliyin, amongst the successful, the the elite. <laughs> write him down. Write her down from the elite, the iliyin. And then the soul is brought back down to the body. The soul is brought back down to the body. Allah, a caller calls out and says, abdi ila al-ard. Return my servant back to the earth. And then the soul is brought back down by the angels. Ila and then the soul is put back into the body. To sit with the body. And then the two angels come. Totally different situation here. The two angels come, Munkar and Nakir, and they tell him to sit up. And they ask him, Man Rabbuk, who is your Lord? And the believing soul says, Rabbi Allah, Allah is my Lord. Wa ma dinuk. And what is your religion? And he says, Dini al Islam, my religion is Islam. And who is your prophet? Nabihi Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He answers the questions correctly, not because of technical knowledge, because he or she lived their entire lives like Allah was their Lord, Islam was their religion, and Muhammad was their messenger. So the answers were very simple. If you studied all week for your test, you don't have to worry about the questions. You don't have to worry about the questions. The questions are simple. When you live your life, when Islam becomes your life, and that's why I said we should stop using this word practicing Islam. I'm not practicing Islam. I live Islam. I lived it. You know when a person say, I live this, you know, they can give you, they can run it down to you like nobody else can. Why? Because they have lived it. I lived Islam. I don't need to study for those questions. I lived it. This is my life. Who is my Lord? Allah is my Lord. Look at how I lived my life. I put God first in everything that I did. I put God first in everything that I did. And you ask me who is my Lord, that's like an insult. <laughs> That's an insult. Who is my Lord? Rabbi Allah, my Lord is Allah. I live my whole life like that. What is your religion? My dini al-Islam. My religion is Islam. I had no other religion. There was nothing else I practiced in my life other than Islam. I don't know another religion. <laughs> and who is your prophet? My prophet is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So what happens to this person? This person, their grave will be spread out for them as far as the eye can see. So this person is in their grave, literally chilling. In their grave, the, the grave opens up for them. This is why 
part of the dua that we make for the person during the janazah, we say, well, and make his grave spacious for him, open his grave for him. That is a little small box that we put him into, but in the spiritual world, he's in a mansion. You understand? Spacious, absolutely, full of light. A fragrance from Jannah is brought down and put into his grave so he can smell the fragrance of Jannah. The angels, they come and they change his shroud and they shroud him with some of the cloths from Jannah. <laughs> they change his shroud. So no matter what you wrap the body in physically, the spirit, the soul will be shrouded with one of the shrouds from Jannah. The fragrance from paradise comes down into the grave. You smell Jannah. You are wrapped in a shroud from the garments of Jannah. Your grave is made spacious. And here's the kicker. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up a window. Iftah lahu. Open up for him a window in Jannah so he can see where he's going. So you're in Jannah. I mean, you're in your grave and you're actually staring at through the window of Jannah and you can actually see where you're going in paradise. That's part of the bliss of the grave that you can actually, Allah opens up a window for you to actually see Jannah. So while you're in your grave, you are anticipating paradise because you can see it with your own eyes. SubhanAllah, man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angels, open up for him a window in paradise. So he can see where he's going. And you're staring. You're in your grave. It's spacious. You smell the fragrance of Jannah. You're wrapped in the shroud of Jannah. And you can actually see your spot in Jannah. You can see it. That's where I'm going? Oh my God. I can't wait. That's where I'm going? That is where I'm going? SubhanAllah. Then Allah tells the angels, open up a window for him in, from the hellfire. And a window to the hellfire will be opened up and he can see where he would have gone had he not lived his life or her life the way that they did. So you will actually be able to see your place in the hellfire that you would have gone had you not done what you've done. And so now it makes you grateful that you made all of the sacrifice. That's where I was going? That's the place in the hellfire where I was going? So now you are even more appreciative of the sacrifices that you made. You're even more appreciative of the sacrifices that you made because now you realize it was all worth it. It was all worth it. SubhanAllah. And not only that, your deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a companion to your grave to sit with you, a good looking companion that sits there with you in your grave. You're not alone. You're there with your companion in your grave. And the companion in your grave, guess who your companion is? Let me see who can figure this out. Allah sends a companion to you, beautiful face, and sits with you in your grave with you until the day of judgment. You know who your companion is? Who, who is your companion? Let me see who can figure this out. Your good deeds. Absolutely. Allah takes all of your good deeds and turns those good deeds into an individual, whatever that individual looks like and that becomes your companion in your grave to sit with you and to tell you you're going to jannah you're going to paradise and talk about all the good things that are going to happen to you and he sit with you in your grave until the day of judgment it's not an angel it's your deeds not the prophet وسلم, no a new wife come on guys you're killing me right now stop stop just stop it please you're killing me your good deeds. And 
be mindful. The whole purpose of this conversation was for us to be more mindful of ourselves. We know that sometimes we get distracted. We know sometimes we're human beings. You know, it happens. We get distracted. But, you know, we need to constantly pull ourselves back in and remind ourselves of the things that really matter. Remind ourselves of the things that really matter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the last of our deeds, the best of our deeds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the best of our years, the last of our years. And may Allah make the best day of our lives, the day that we meet him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam al taslim al kathira. Wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.